Hello and welcome from all of us here at the Wildlife Conservation Trust. This Wildlife Week, we are delighted to welcome you to an important panel discussion, which is about the illegal wildlife trade, but exotic species, you know, which receive less conservation attention as compared to native species. Let me start by uh, giving a comparative example. So we all know that there are more captive tigers around the world than there are in the wild. And that makes us very angry. You know, we are disgusted looking at you know, videos of pet tigers around the world and rightfully so. But there could be innumerable species. There are innumerable species which don't get as much attention and they're going down the same route. Take the African gray parrot, for example very popular as a pet, so common that you could find one in your friend's house and you know you won't be you won't be surprised. The global conservation status of this species was listed as least concern by the IUCN in 2004. In 2018, the IUCN declared it as endangered in just a matter of 14 years. This is because of the demand for exotic wild pets. You know, it's pushing innumerable species into the abyss of extinction. And the growing demand for exotic wild pets from India also is contributing to this problem in a big way. Trade in native species in India is prohibited, but there are several the innumerable exotic wild species that are trafficked into the country to the illegal pet trade route, and they are not provided any protection on our soil, neither is their trade regulated. This problem requires urgent attention and the formulation of strong laws to regulate the exotic species trade in our country. Today, we are going to discuss this problem and explore solutions. Today's discussion will be moderated by our very own Dr. Anish Andheria. Anish is a Carl Zeiss Conservation Awardee and the President of the Wildlife Conservation Trust. He is a member of several government committees, including the National Tiger Conservation Authority, the State Boards of Wildlife of Maharashtra and Jammu and Kashmir, and the executive committee of the Gujarat State Lion Conservation Society, among others. He is also a member of the governing council of the Bombay Natural History Society. Our first panelist is Mridula Vijay Raghavan. Mridula is an environmental lawyer who is passionate about law surrounding wildlife conservation and large development projects. She has worked at WCS India, where she focused largely on law and policy surrounding wildlife trade and its implementation in close collaboration with government departments and agencies. Our next panelist is Sumant Bindu Madhav. Sumant has a decade of experience in detection, prevention, and rescue of wild animals from the illegal wildlife trade. He continues to work on policy and advocacy-centric interventions that seek to regulate domestic and international trade of exotic and endemic wildlife. He is presently associated with the Humane Society International India. And then we have our very own Samyukta. Samyukta is a forensic scientist who has been focused on developing capacity in the application of forensics for a wide variety of audiences. She heads wildlife forensics at WCT and leads the program on improving wildlife crime investigations through the use of forensics. Now that looks like it's going to be an exciting and engaging discussion. I'll get out of the way. I've done enough talking and I would request Dr. Andheria to start the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Rizwan. Uh, welcome, Mridula, Soman, and Samyukta. The topic that we are discussing today is very, very close to our hearts. All of us collectively have you know, felt the pain, have felt the frustration. When we see well-meaning people catalyzing trade in exotic animals, so these are not people who are villains. These are not people who hate wildlife. These are, some of them are extremely fond of mother nature and wild animals. India as a nation is one of the most uh, well-known nations when it comes to conservation of wild flora and fauna. Nearly 5% of our country is under the protected area network. There are more than 870 protected areas in the country. Several of our species are endangered. However, Pretty much every species that is found within our administrative limits is protected by law. It is almost impossible to get away if you get caught, even while hunting an animal which is not as endangered as a tiger. And when we talk of uh, love and culture of our country for nature, it's uh, probably extremely unique country because 
people worship nature people worship wild animals people worship plants i have been i would say i can't call myself fortunate but i have been in situations where i've seen a mother who is sitting close to a dead body of her young son probably 17 or 18 year old son uh, who is just been trampled by an elephant in karnataka and uh, i have spent a lot of time in that state so i understand a bit of kannada and she in her own kurba dialect is um, angry but angry at her son for going into the forest at 4:30 in the morning not even once did she curse the elephant that was the reason behind the death of the son now that is unheard of i have friends across the planet i've never seen that kind of connection or the umbilical cord between nature and people of india is still intact and i whenever i go and speak outside i invite people to india to experience this and uh, while i work on conservation and my organization has been trying to you know further the cause of conservation for more than a decade now we are pleasantly surprised all the time when we go and interact with communities outside even while we work uh, when we have discussions within cities we know of a lot of people who feel very very strongly about forest and wildlife however some of those very people unknowingly are conduits to this extremely injurious trade which is not only brewing for many many decades but in the recent past there has been an escalation in not only the number of new species that have got added into it but in the sheer number of individuals that are being traded across our administrative boundaries and this is two way which means wild species are being smuggled into india at the same time native species are leaving our administrative boundaries and going into the other other nations so today's discussion i think uh, with people who are as experienced as you are i hope it is an eye opener to a lot of well meaning people who are listening to us and act as a deterrent to people who don't care or do respect nature so let's start um, this is going to be a free flowing discussion i will put across a few questions to you however feel free to cover more than what the answer to my question can cover because i think this particular discussion is going to be online forever and uh, hopefully it will be used as educational material in uh, several colleges it will also help budding lawyers a uh, conservationists and the common man who can be uh, or is consumer of many of these uh, hapless but extremely extremely beautiful and extremely important uh, species so i welcome all three of you once again before we start into the the real issues i would want samyukta to you know talk about the reasons why there is a rise in demand and what actually motivates people to keep exotic pets because it's very very you know people who love the forest uh, go to the forest to watch wildlife but the same people don't think twice before you know going and buying pygmy marmoset or a turtle um, even something like a lemur is not very difficult to find in some of our big cities within the country so samyukta it'll be important for us to know why what is it that drives drives this Sure. Thanks, Anish. So, as far as our understanding goes, currently the reason why people take to pet or uh, keeping of wild animal as pets is multi-varied, right? So, it could be because somebody is looking for companionship, and uh, they feel that having a pet uh, like a fish or a turtle or a lizard or a bird is much low main, much more low maintenance than having a dog or a cat, right? So, that could be one of the reasons. Another reason could be. simply like you said the need to connect with nature and then the only way they know how to do that is to bring a part of nature home and have it present within their immediate habitat culturally speaking hobbies of pet keeping have been passed on from the times of rulers like the mughals and others who kept it as a as a not only as a hobby but also as a show and display of wealth so now with increasing expandable incomes for the modern india hobbies which are as expensive not just on the pocket but on time and other things like keeping of exotic animals are starting to pick up uh, steam this is not to say that or not to uh, downplay the role that media has in uh, you know making animals uh, as this exciting uh, thing that you want to keep at home uh, movies uh, cinema 
advertisements they all uh, show the good side of oh such beautiful cuddly animals right but nobody is talking about the other side of the pet trade and which is why most keepers of wild animals as pets are unaware of the behind the scenes of how the animal even comes to become a pet uh and perhaps today as our discussion progresses that's one of the key things that we'd like to uh bring to light uh as sumanth and mrudula will agree but yeah that's the to cut a long story short these are the very things that uh, would cause people to keep exotic animals as pets uh thank you samyukta and i'm sure the internet also is helping in this a lot because i think there is a spike in it after the internet era started i think what the internet does is it it creates access directly to a lot of traders uh, and buyers so it creates a lot of channels of communication with them with no requirement of a middleman like a pet shop so it it's created a new channel of trade that is easy uh, also pet shops now have a lot of regulations so they can bypass all of that and reduce the cost to themselves by directly dealing with say a dealer sitting in africa or costa rica or brazil right so that kind of trade can happen because of the internet whereas earlier we were far more restricted to what was available at your neighborhood pet shop or a pet shop somewhere within your country so yes definitely the internet has contributed so my next question is to mridula mridula um, will you spend a few minutes explaining what cites is because uh, that will come up in our discussion and it's important that the audience understands what it is um, and also the fact that india is a signatory to cites uh, since many decades now and my the second half of my uh, question is is uh, despite being a signatory why are there hardly any restrictions with respect to possessing or trading or breeding exotic animals in india over to you mridula thanks anish um certainly so the society so is is the convention on international trade in endangered species of wild flora and fauna and um this was a multilateral agreement entered into by about 183 countries several decades ago in the early 70s and the aim of this convention is to regulate the trade in in wildlife with the intention of making sure that we don't basically kill and uh, basically go on a rampage and um, see the end of wildlife so it's important to remember that cites is not a conservation tool per se it is simply a leg- regulatory mechanism to make sure that we are t- only you know trading in a sustainable manner uh, in in wild animals across countries what is um, beautiful about the cites i think is that it's one of those rare international conventions that is actually seeing implementation um so you you find that there are certain permits needed whether they are import or export permits in order to trade in wild animals the the convention has three lists called appendices and there's appendix 1 2 and 3 and each of these has a has a different level of protection so for instance uh, chimpanzees um or the puma are appendix 1 species granted the highest highest level of protection uh, for which you know to trade in them you need an import permit from the country into which the animal is being imported and an export permit to the country that is sending the animal out and these are typically done only for say a zoo trying to import an animal or for research uh, and not for commercial uses there is appendix 2 and 3 which are slightly lower layers of protection uh, which only require an export permit uh and and appendix 3 species actually have the least protection and each country can decide which animal they want to have in, have in appendix 3 and it is only uh for these species that you need an export permit or you know if you if it's coming from a country that hasn't listed the animal in that appendix you need only a, a certificate of origin so that's broadly what the convention does um as you rightly pointed out anish we've been you know we ratified this convention in 1976 it's been decades and um, there's a measure to to tell how well a party is implementing cites into their national legislation so it's important to remember that the success of this convention rests very heavily on how it is implemented into domestic law by various parties and there are three categories 
that basically say either they've implemented the convention fully into, into the domestic law, or they've kind of not done a great job. Those are category two, two um, countries that basically don't meet all the requirements for implementation. Or there's category three that's basically implemented nothing so far. India is a category two country. And we are also demarcated as a priority country, given that there is extremely high, um, you know, the magnitude of trade, both as a source country and as it's emerging now, also as a demand country is quite high. And given the fact that we've, you know, we've been party to this convention for 20 years and still not implemented it fully, we are now recognized as a priority state. And so really the pressure is on for us to implement it fully. And at the, the COP in 2017, um, you know, there was, there was a lot of noise about countries not implementing it adequately. And there is now a, a deadline for, the, you know, by the next COP in 2022 that we're expected to fully implement it. Um, just a last, I think, important point to mention here is India has, since 2017, been telling the CITES Secretariat that, oh, oh, hey, we're, you know, we're just finalizing our draft. We're still finalizing our draft. And as of July 2020, which was the last update India gave the Secretariat, we're still in the process of finalizing a draft. Um, so, so that's basically where India stands with regards to CITES. Um, now, the, the other part of your question, Anish, about uh, why are there still no restrictions on possession, trade, and breeding of species within India? So um, we actually have mechanisms that regulate the import and export of, of exotic wildlife, or even native wildlife for that matter, through the, a legal regi uh, regime that is basically formulated by the Customs Act and the Foreign Trade Development Regulation Act, the FTDRA. And we have an import and export policy revised every five years that basically says that, you know, the requirements societies have to be fulfilled for the import of it or export of any, any species. The legal vacuum lies in trade in these exotic animals domestically. So if I manage to smuggle an animal into India, I can sell it to anybody with with absolutely no legal ramifications. Um, in 2013, we had uh, an, um, a wildlife amendment bill that was placed before the Rajya Sabha. And this amendment bill actually did a fairly impressive job of trying to include CITES listed species within uh, the existing framework of the Wildlife Act, and also place um, prohibitions on exactly what you said, which is the trade possession and breeding of animals. Uh, so I think largely the reason why we're still not fully compliant is political will. And I think that it really comes down to that at the end of the day. Yeah, so Mridula, just one more question that uh, I thought of while you were talking. Can you list down a, a few countries that are really, really, who have taken CITES seriously? I am, I, am, I would say um, all this, smuggling and the trade happens because there is demand so if mm -hmm. those countries where people are you know very um, used to keeping pets are there any such country that has really uh, clamped down upon this uh, is there an example uh, globally that we can look look up to or you know pretty much it's a lost cause wherever you go so I think there are varying degrees. There's a lot of countries that are in category one that have fully implemented CITES as it is expected to, to be. Uh, China is actually one of them. Um, it, it has implemented to the CITES to the full extent uh, possible. But even in a country that has that is you know category one and has done its job to the T, there still exist uh, problems within domestic policy. So for instance, there's the, the issue of stock existing stockpiles of say pangolin scales, which you can use in China and you can sell in China um, as long as they're from this existing stockpile. But um, you know, how long can the stock stockpile last? 
uh, and and so there's some very fundamental questions about this policy, um, and and so I I don't think it's a lost cause. I just think there are varying degrees of its implementation, um, and it's heartening to see that the CIT Secretariat is taking a taking a very proactive um, stance towards making sure that all the parties are implementing it, uh, going to the extent of providing legislative support, um, and you know putting and actually giving giving you know giving consultancy services to countries that want to have better law um so so i don't think it's a lost cause thanks about that uh sumant now over to you both samyukta and Bridula have kind of mentioned that the, this trade is prevalent we don't know the exact numbers but it's definitely huge it will run into thousands probably lakhs and this is i'm talking about annually and this is only about those animals that survive it okay we all know that whenever there is a demand for a particular species people who are responsible for 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 catching that species in the wild will always factor for damage which means either death injury during the journey so they will go and get more animals than what is required so for for instance i was told by a friend that if somebody requires a falcon, nearly five falcons are collected so that that one falcon reaches and therefore the costs are huge. So there are thousands of animals that are actually currently living inside homes in India, but there are many more that uh, were caught or either that died while they were trying to catch them or because a mother was taken out, the Babies who are dependent on the mother died. So there is thousands and thousands of these animals belonging to different species um, that feed the pet trade annually. Uh, we also know that our government and the customs and several other agencies do detect this. But how, what, according to you, and you have uh, several years of experience, what is that ratio of detection to non detection? Because you hear about these news items on television. Um, about a consignment that was caught at Bombay airport or crossing the borders in the Northeast or at the India-Nepal border. But we don't know exactly how many actually escaped detection. So do you have any rough figure as to what are we looking at? Thanks, thanks Anish for that. Um, and I think you bring up a very pertinent point and like what Samyukta, you and Rudula have been saying, uh, we are all aware that record keeping in general is not a strong, a strong point of Indian uh, law enforcement, unfortunately. There's also too much put into one agency. For instance, as, the, uh, as a signatory to CITES, India has to have a CITES management authority, which in India is one person. Whoever holds the rank of the additional director general of forest is the CITES management authority, which is putting more on an already overburdened plate. Uh, the Forest Department and the Ministry of Environment and Forest and Climate Change is already stretched really, really thin. Uh, like you know, the Forest Department is, is doing everything from planting trees to solving conflict to detecting crime and now forensics also, which is a great tool for them. Uh, add to that also monitoring, having to monitor any trade in exotic species is just too much. Uh, because of that, I think the CITES management authority, you can't blame them for it, but records do slip up. Uh, there's no accurate record keeping. And the government agencies often refuse to talk to each other as fluently as they should. Customs, DGFT, WCCB, which is the Wildlife Crime Control Bureau, and the CITES management authority. All of these agencies don't necessarily speak well to each other. Of course, there's also the forest department and police, which are other law enforcement agencies who do get involved in these. In the, in the recent past, we've also seen the DRI, the Directorate of Revenue Intelligence, getting heavily involved in uh, any form of trade of animals. Again, this is too many agencies not speaking to each other, not sharing information, uh, unfortunately. And what that leads to is really, really poor record keeping. So while we don't have official figures of how many uh, are missed for every that is seized, we know from experience that it's easily a one is to 10 ratio for every one that you do catch, there's at least 10 that you miss. For, to give you an example, 
uh, I think in, in when when uh, I think there was about thirty thousand people that declared uh, themselves having exotic um, exotic animals in their in their custody. Uh, just in the last two years, we know from the confiscated records that at least twelve thousand turtles have just been caught. Just turtles. This is not counting mammals. This is not counting birds. Not counting reptiles, which make up which make up a huge portion of the trade. So you can just get an idea of how many we're missing for every one that is actually detected and caught. It's a huge, huge figure. And uh, if you were just to look look at the numbers from customs versus numbers from CITES Management Authority. We know for a fact from a recent, uh, recently published study that 98.6% of, of uh, uh, imports in India have not been registered with the CITES Management Authority. And that is a huge, huge number. 98.6 is just is something that you can't just uh, overlook at all. Um, so that, that should speak volumes about how, many, how much we miss in detection and how much we actually look for. Also, I think what Mithil has said, uh, the, the political will is severely lacking. It's not like the customs or any of these agents are specifically looking for animals in massive containers that land at ports, for instance. The, all the seizures that we see, all the ones that we do see confiscated are those where they have specific intelligence about a particular container carrying X number of animals or animal articles. That's the only one that they will look closely with a fine comb and find what they find. Uh, everything else that passes through is just, we, we have no idea of the true scale of this, to be honest. Wow. It's, uh, I mean, we knew about this, but to, to hear it in pure numbers, it's quite startling. But what I'm hopeful about is that while there is no political will, that doesn't seem to be a real reason why there is no political will, so, which means that if agencies, organizations, individuals can work with our policymakers and politicians, it should not be difficult to, because this is illegal trade. This is not money that's getting into the government. This is not something that a country is benefiting from, right, uh, directly. Uh, it only means that there is no awareness and they don't understand the connection between possessing a wild species and the impact it has on the population of that species in its native country and uh, the cascading effect of that on the ecosystem. So now with climate change and the threats from climate change looming large, people have started talking about biodiversity loss and climate change in the same you know, uh, breath. Basically, they now interchangeably talk about biodiversity loss and climate change, which is a good thing because uh, people thought climate change is about degradation of forests. If you can get the forest back, which means if you can do some silly plantation, which is just monoculture, you know, thousands and thousands of plants of the same species, that's good enough to fight climate change. But science and thousands of research articles have now shown that a forest is a forest only if the biodiversity is intact. And uh, this trade in exotic species, uh, the impact of this is extra limital, which means that what happens here in India has a implication and negative one in a country which is probably 5,000 kilometers away. So that awareness, if somebody can make a sub submission to our political leadership, I'm sure India, knowing its culture, uh, may be able to change the tide. I'm not uh, sure how easily it can happen, but I'm quite optimistic that I think the effort has not been made. Obviously, signing CITES is not helping much. And so we must try this new route where we can jointly a lot of organizations like ours can come together and uh, you know have a dialogue with our politicians i think if we are able to do that we'll you know at least know that we we have tried right now i don't see uh, of a movement or a campaign that is directed towards so i think only 30000 people declaring pet animals i'm sure there are 30000 people between delhi and bombay who own exotic species so now uh, coming back to samyukta we've already seen that uh, you know that trade is prevalent we already know uh, that it is not only uh, something that you see in cities it also has found its way into smaller towns especially now that we know that it's not only about mammals it's about insects it's about reptiles it's about arachnids like spiders and scorpions so just coming back to you know mridula touched upon it but to reiterate is it legal? Now, 
think about uh, a person who doesn't know this they know for sure that you cannot have a tiger in their homes but they don't know if a marmoset which is found in a country which is thousands of kilometers away what is the harm in having a bush baby or a marmoset what is the law going to do to me so today if we ask that question what is the current scenario in front of us sure anish um so i think it's critical to look at that from two three different laws that currently are present in the country uh, one is of course the wildlife protection act of 1972 under whose ambit uh, no exotic species is covered right so you could freely own keep uh, and trade in exotic species like nidula said if you were able to smuggle the animal in without detection once it's in your home once it's in your shop once it's in your establishment there's nothing really preventing any uh, or uh, giving any agency the power to come and clamp down on you right uh then there is another law which is the prevention of cruelty to animals act uh, 1962 which could play a significant role in preventing people from keeping exotic animals in poor conditions which means uh the cages are not correctly sized or the the uh, the sanitation is not been maintained correctly or the water is not sufficient or bad quality or the food is not correct basically the resources to maintain that animal are not in the right form uh but the pitiful thing here is that currently the uh, punishment under the uh, 1962 act the prevention of cruelty to animals act if somebody were to be caught keeping an animal like in poor conditions exotic or otherwise is only 50 rupees and at the worst case 100 rupees which honestly is not a deterrent in any way whatsoever whether it's an urban population or a rural population a 50 rupee in today's time is is small change right so it's of no consequence other than that like mudala and uh, suman both said it's a question of implementation so if at the border when the animal is being brought in if the detection is not happening if the arrest is not happening at that point there's really little to nothing that anybody can do once the animal is safely within uh, the legal borders uh, cites as well also strongly recommends that uh while cites dictates how these various protection measures are in place etc it is upon the the party to ensure that the protection is maintained and like nidula said it has to be brought in through legislation that is prevalent and can be implemented within the country so currently uh, unfortunately and i hope none of our, the audience listening in takes this the wrong way but there's nothing that anybody can do if you own uh, that exotic animal and keep it appalling actually so mridula what are the uh, legal roadblocks why can't we get this done you know it 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 seems like common sense because india is uh, so concerned about its own wildlife and so many other countries are and so many species are protected by law why what is the hindrance why are we not able to have a law which becomes like a global law when it comes to trading of any species shanish um so i think that there are administrative roadblocks more than there are legal roadblocks and um, i think before i answer your question in more detail i think um, it's very important to to visit an advisory that the the ministry of environment and forests issued in june 2020 and um, this advisory essentially seeks to fill the legal vacuum that we've been talking about that samyukta samyukta also mentioned that there's nothing preventing someone from being in possession of a an african grey parrot right now um so this advisory was was basically issued saying that you know i you are granted amnesty if you declare to the chief wildlife warden of your state that that you are in possession of a certain animal um actually you know just to explain this advisory better I, and and what it does a little better I put together a slide so maybe this this might be the right time um so i took the liberty to use uh, michael jackson and his pet chimpanzee god bless his soul but um so so let's just take a hypothetical here where let's say he smuggled a chimpanzee from the congo into mumbai and he declares to the chief wildlife warden that look i have this chimpanzee in my house and it is now my pet what the advisory does is that it gives the chief wildlife warden the the power to regularize this illegal import 
So the advisory asks that the chief ILF warden must physically verify, you know, the animal that the person is declaring. So in this case, he would go and check out this chimpanzee and say, okay, great, you have a chimpanzee. Here is a, a certificate of possession. So now you're in legal possession of this animal that you actually smuggled in by violating existing law and violating CITES. So now what has happened now is that, uh, you know, it's essentially regularizing illegality. And Michael Jackson is now in, a, in, in legal possession of this chimpanzee. The only liability existing on him is to let the chief wildlife warden know if he comes into possession of any other animal or if the animal dies, or if it gives birth, or if it, uh, you know, if he's trading this chimpanzee further, he's expected to let the chief wildlife warden know that this is what is happening. What are the repercussions of not doing any of these things, however, is extremely unclear. So it's important to, to understand that the, an advisory is subordinate legislation. It is actually not even subordinate legislation. It is meant to act, you know, it's almost along the lines of a request uh, at best. So we saw, you know, during the pandemic, we saw the Ministry of Health issue an advisory saying, hey, please, can you distance yourself socially? And there are no ramifications to not doing so. So for an advisory to come in and have several shall clauses, uh, which a shall clause essentially says that, you know, is, is legally binding. Uh, it makes no sense because what happens if this shall clause is violated? There is no law that this advisory is taking root in. So the advisory essentially says that if the person uh, declaring the animal does not say report the death of that animal, the chief wildlife warden is empowered to take action as appropriate. What does action as appropriate mean? Um, you know, when there's an offense under the Wildlife Act, there are clear penalties. And there's, you know, it's very clear what happens if you are in illegal possession of a pangolin. Uh, but that is not the case under the advisory. So it, it doesn't hold water. Um, now, also, there is no problem, really. I mean, fundamentally, at the core of it, it is not problematic to grant an amnesty to those who are in possession of an animal. When the Wildlife Act was, imp was implemented in 1972, it gave a six month period during which people could come and declare that my great grandfather had this tiger claw and I'm in possession of it. And in, you know, against that tiger claw, this person was given a certificate of possession under the Wildlife Act. So in principle, um, the amnesty isn't quite the problem. I think more fundamentally, what is the problem is what happens next? There is no law regulating imports in the future. The, the advisory also goes on to prescribe measures for further imports of any animal. Uh, talks about the, the requirement for an import license, the requirement for health certificates and pre registration with the chief wildlife warden. But again, there's no clarity on what happens if these are flouted, because this is not a law. Uh, more than anything else, I think it's the existing legal framework is, a, is quite um, layered in that you have multiple uh, agencies coming together to implement the law. You have the WCCB issuing uh, permits. You have customs authorities uh, that actually implement this law at ports of entry. But what becomes of an illegal import is not clear under this advisory. And, and so though it creates an inventory of how many illegal species are held in the country, it doesn't do much, you know, after that. Um, it's also interesting to see that this, this advisory was, um, was the subject of some litigation before three different high courts and the Supreme Court of India. But the fact that it is not legally viable uh, never came up. And so, you know, Anish, when we talk about what, what are the legal roadblocks, I think this is one of them. Uh, this, this advisory has also shown that to have a, the chief wildlife warden physically verify, you know, there, there have been 43,000 odd declarations under the advisory. To have them physically verify each one of these is near impossible. Like Sumanth also mentioned, we just don't have the capacity to undertake 
an exercise of this magnitude. So um, there's been a, there's, I think what we really need to do is to amend the law at this juncture to, to include CITES within the ambit of the Wildlife Act. Uh, which we had actually almost achieved in 2013, uh, and that fell. So, so Anish, I, I feel extremely optimistic when you say that you know it's possible to garner political will. You know, we've seen that a similar attempt was made uh, nearly a decade ago, and it's not impossible to revive it and actually set right what this advisory has now done. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Mridula. So, I think in a country where we have been able to successfully conserve tigers, leopards, even small species. And we don't really know, other than the tiger, we don't know how many individuals of bats are there in a cave, forget in a cave, in a jungle, yet we, we do protect them under an umbrella, a law which is acts as an umbrella. So to protect animals within four walls or to detect these species within one wall should not be very, very difficult. So I think um, slowly one must make representations to the government and it will have to happen at a mass level, which means a campaign at a probably a media campaign and, you know, pretty much all organizations working in the field of conservation, animal rights should also participate. If that happens, uh, knowing India's track record, I think we will move from category two to category one soon. And in fact, India has the ability to go even one step further. If, like you said, if they can include CITES regulations within the Wildlife Protection Act, uh, we would probably be the ones who will show the guiding light to so many other countries. So let's not aim small, let's aim big and, and kind of work at that. We do now, we have spoken about species that are in trade. We also know that they are creating smuggling of these species and also death of animals during the transaction or during transits uh, is also a big issue. But Sumanth, uh, what about cruelty? Because there is a, to, to imagine that you are feeding a pet animal as many times that animal wants to eat or you are maintaining that animal in an air-conditioned room, sanitized room, probably if it's a bird, you know, you think velvet is good for you. So you make a perch which is covered in velvet and a cage that is plated with gold. From our perspective, you know, you are treating that animal at par with other individuals in your house. But is there any study or from your experience, do we know of the kind of cruelty or the kind of pain that an animal goes through? And obviously that animal cannot talk to you because we don't understand their language. That animal is probably talking to you, but we don't understand. Can you discuss and also enlighten the audience about the, the issue on the kind of impact it has on the behavior and also on the psyche of, of a species or an individual that is being smuggled or is sitting in a plush flat in a big metropolis within Bombay or Delhi. Thanks, Anish. And I think uh, there are two sides of it, right? I mean, there is one side who is who, who are all the folks who are importing, breeding these animals and selling. There's a different layer of cruelty there versus people who are buying and keeping at home. So let's look at these two in, in their own buckets that they deserve. The ones who are importing and breeding them, for them, it's just another product that that they get money from. So the, to invest in welfare means the input cost is that much higher and they have nothing to gain. Irrespective of how they breed the animal and how they keep it, their profit margin remains the same. They don't get a higher margin for keeping, uh, for, for seeing to welfare of an animal in captivity before it's sold. So they have no vested interest in making sure that the animal is well kept or well uh, are well taken care of in terms of its physical health, medical health, and mental health, which is a huge issue, right? I mean, uh, animal husbandry practices in general in India is, is quite an amazing stage. Uh, even when it comes to animals as common as dogs, not everyone is equipped to, get, to take care of them very, very well, even though they've been with us for hundreds of years now. Uh, these animals that we're bringing into our country, let's say somebody's bringing in a, a ball python, they know by and large what a snake eats. So they'll try and find rodents around their house, they'll throw one in, they'll find a frog, they'll, they'll drop one in and hopes, and, and then they hope that these animals survive. And unfortunately, a lot of these animals are really hardy and they will consume whatever food is given and survive, but nowhere near in the best quality of life that they need to have. They're often in very, very tiny cages. They're, in, they're, they're used as production machines where they're impregnated several more times than they should be. 
Um, and the, there's also this innate craze of uh, selective breeding animals, especially with reptiles. Uh, they want to make uh, scaleless snakes. They want to have different patterns on the, on the bodies of the snakes. Uh, there's, an in, in, there's an insane amount of cruelty in, in that aspect of it that, again, uh, like Samyukta said, is widely unregulated because of the scale of it. There's thousands and thousands of people in every city who are doing it, um, and no law enforcement has the bandwidth to go door to door and check on this. Even if they do, the only regulation right now that you can sort of uh, bring some amount of accountability is the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. And like Samyukta mentioned, the, the, the penalty for that is, is meager 50 rupees. And anybody who's trading in these animals would be, it's, it's nothing for them. They're spending thousands and thousands of rupees and bringing these animals and breeding them. 50 rupee penalty is next to nothing for them. That's one layer with this severe amount of cruelty. Like you said, the transit is, is an incredibly painful process. We've seen small birds being smuggled from one city uh, of India to another in a variety of means. Uh, and without going into too much detail to make it gory, we've seen small birds being cramped into uh, toothpaste boxes, large toothpaste boxes, and being sent uh, in, in buses, in, in luggage compartments of buses from one place to another. Like you said, there's always buffer, right? They, if they want five, they'll send 20, because they know that about 50 to 60% of them will die in transit. But the profit margins for them are so high because they're breeding them in really poor conditions that it offsets all the loss of animals in, in transit. It's, it's nothing for them. The second uh, sort of layer of cruelty comes in, in people keeping them at home. Uh, and that's often guided by how cutely look these animals look. Right? I and mean, when somebody is walking by an aquarium, they see a red-eared slider in a tank and they want it. The child wants it, somebody wants it at home. Uh, so they go and buy it because it's, this, it's tiny. It's the size of a 10 rupee coin or a slightly like bigger. But they pay 30 or 40 rupees or whatever for a red-eared slider now, bring it home, and suddenly they realize that it's, 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 it's a lot of effort to take care of this animal. Uh, it's not as simple as feeding it. These animals do get big, which, which, which beats me how people never think of when they're buying these small animals. Um, and red-eared sliders do get big, do get voracious in terms of appetite, and they do get uh, not so easy to take care of anymore. At that point of time, people do a couple of things. The one, they start, uh, they start taking care of them really, really poorly because, and we've seen this happen so many times, right? We've seen in uh, cities like Bangalore, for instance, people bring in serval cats, which are these African wild cats into their homes as pets. And these are cats that can jump 10, 15 feet off the ground standing. Uh, they deserve to be in large open plains, not in a 1200 square feet apartment in Bangalore. Uh, they obviously don't get enough exercise. But people think that if they're giving them enough food and love and affection, that's enough for the animal. We often humanize these animals and say that the animal comes and sleeps with me on the bed, so it's really it's, it's in a happy place. Uh, we attach human emotions to these animals and say they're they're well and good. Uh, we often ignore what is ecologically, physiologically needed for that particular species. Having a serval cat and having a cat like a like a domestic cat at home are two very different things. We often look at them as the same, and there's an insane amount of cruelty there. It may not appear to be cruel at the offset. It, the, you might not see anybody beating up an animal, but the manner in which it's kept, the food it's fed, uh, those are all instances of cruelty too. We've seen serval cats being in vegetarian households and then only feeding them vegetarian food because they don't want to bring meat into the house. Those are absolutely unfair on the animal and it compromises on the animal's health severely. Uh, we've seen birds that are fed very, very wrong diets because of influence of media or whatever they've been told by somebody who, who, who has these birds and they're in absolutely miserable health conditions. Very often we've seen that it, it comes to a point where the animal is visibly sick, uh, visibly looks diseased. They don't want to care for it anymore because medical treatment for these exotic animals is, of course, very expensive as well. They often end up going and releasing them outside their house. And the, the sentiment is, uh, I'm doing the right thing by releasing this wild animal back in the wild. And that's, that's just a, uh, that's, that's a wormhole, that's a rabbit hole by itself. And it brings uh, plenty of, plenty of uh, issues in itself. But 
the entire supply chain right from the time of import of the animal to the time the animal is either released or the animal dies a very painful death is just riddled with cruelty at various points of this timeline. And it's, again, uh, while we have new rules brought in, like the pet shop rules, which sort of uh, mandates that everybody who sells these animals have to be registered, that's still under the gambit of the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act as the overarching act, which itself has really, really poor penalties. But I do share your uh, optimism, optimism, Anish. I think it's, it takes a lot of us speaking to our elected representatives and asking for better standards for, uh, for these animals in general. I do think that's the only way forward. I can't say thank you for explaining this because it's painful to hear this. Obviously, we are exposed because of the work we do to this, but yet listening to you again about the same thing that I already know is no less painful. And there were many things that when you were talking uh, were running in my head parallelly. For instance, we look at the adoption laws in India. It was very archaic. People would, uh, you know, it's uh, adopting children and that became a trade really, right? And uh, parents, whether they were well-to-do, whether they had the capacity, not only uh, financial, but mental capacity to bring up children, they would still go and actually go and window shop for children. That was not many decades ago. Now, that law has become very strong. It's not easy to adopt a child. The child doesn't have a choice. Uh, and so the so one has to make it doubly sure that the family or the individual who is asking for adoption is assessed. Uh, there is enough due diligence that's done on it. So when we, it comes to human beings, we are trying to sharpen our laws, make it uh, as fair uh, as possible for the vulnerable stakeholder. Because we are implementing it on the human side, I think it is possible to extend it to non-human animals as well, because we understand life. We are living beings. So we can't say we don't know what's happening to a plant uh, when you cut or chop a, a branch. Uh, just because it's a plant, we think that, you know, we would do the same to a living animal, but it's very easy to chop a branch away. And we say, oh, we can't feel whether it's happening or not. It's, it's not true because we are living beings. So we need to understand. So there are laws on the human side. I think if we can extend it, uh, so we don't really have to do much, uh, you know, something which is out of the world, right? So that's one. Second, is you brought up a uh, important point of picking up anything from outside and feeding your animal. Can you imagine the kind of pesticides and the pollutants and the disease that's there? We don't even know how much and what all is there. So if you have a pet and if you are feeding or if the pet is uh, left loose in your farmland because you have area and that animal goes and picks uh, animals that are available or present in the wild, the kind of disease transfer that can happen from one to another is one issue. Pollutants that can enter into the digestive tract of that animal is another one. So that itself is a big thing. Releasing your animal in the wild means you are actually destabilizing the ecosystem in your own country. Because for instance, I know of a case where a reticulated python that was rescued, it was not confiscated. It had come in with a ship that had brought in a consignment of wood and from some, I think Malaysia, I don't remember the country, but it was a Southeast Asian country. And it was found in the Bombay Port Trust area. And some people went and rescued. They were called to rescue a python when they went, it was obviously a python, but it was a reticulated python. They were well-meaning, but they didn't know that it was a reticulated python. And uh, obviously, they took permissions to release. And that python got released in the wild in a forest close to Bombay. Reticulated pythons can grow to almost 30 feet. It's not found in the country. It can pretty much swallow anything from a crocodile to a human being to anything. And to have a predator, and if she, it was a female, and if if she was gravid, you can imagine what a thing like this can do. So it can, uh, apart from the disease that the animal can acquire, the what and the disease that they can spread, it can be a great, I mean, it can destabilize the ecosystem. And you know of so many instances across the planet where, uh, for instance, the Burmese python problem that America is facing today is because a lot of people, once the python reaches a certain size and they start feeling threatened by the animal, or because the place where it's kept is too small, the animals are left. Today, America is slaughtering Burmese python, hundreds of them weekly, and yet they are not even able to scratch the problems that are caused because of it, because so many native species are now at the brink of extinction because the pythons 
are pretty much voracious uh, hunters and they are highly highly adaptive and so things like this you can reintroduce an alien species in a that impact is massive so that brings me to a, a very very important issue now we are all in the grips of one of the deadliest pandemics that the planet has seen over the last century and uh, we are pretty much in house arrest as all of us are sitting and talking uh, from our respective homes uh, we know the price that the planet has paid not only india but the planet whether it's a a developed nation or a developing nation or under developed nation problems because of the pandemic are well known it is only logical to kind of expect that when there is so much of trade which is not regulated and wild animals from different parts of the world could be from congo could be from brazil uh, rainforest somewhere could be from papua new guinea or could be from australia and these species when they are smuggled across the planet and the kind of fauna and flora that exists within their bodies in terms of pathogens in terms of other things the risk that it can pose to species to human beings uh, samyukta can you throw some light on it because talking about it about 2 years ago people would say don't worry about it now we know what can happen because there is a direct link between covid-19 and the wet markets in china so can you throw some light on that impact of disease on the planet as as the whole sure anish uh so one of the larger uh, outcomes of illegal wildlife trade as pet trade comes under the umbrella of Uh, is that it's brought wild animals and their several pathogens that they naturally host in their bodies in very close proximity to humans that weren't at all prepared or their immune systems were not were not at all prepared to now suddenly interact with these pathogens uh, and pathogens as we all know are looking for that one break uh, in an opportunity where they can now quickly transmit uh, to a host and multiply in large volumes right so if you were to just look at the covid-19 pandemic as an example uh, like you said the china wet markets uh, where it suspected that the disease came from bats and from bats was moved to an intermediary animal and from there went to uh, volumes of people who then of course transmitted to other people that they came in touch with right so this is a classic example of a zoonotic disease and one of the big issues with illegal wildlife trade and pet trade in particular is the transmission of such dangerous zoonotic diseases that people are exposed to the minute they bring such wild animals into very close proximity of themselves uh if we look back in time there's several studies that i know sumanth is uh, as hsi have done where uh, mahouts who work in close proximity with elephants have contracted tb directly from those elephants right it's a known uh, co- direct correlation uh people who live in close proximity with birds are known to have uh, severe respiratory disorders that come from the feces or pathogens that are uh, carried in those feces uh i think that till the covid-19 actually broke out a lot of people were either uh, not aware of zoonotic diseases or treated it as something that happens on another planet because i live in a city i'm far cut off from this problem it's of no consequence to me but the larger fear that no one wants to face is that in almost all cities in our country right now there are these these brooding markets uh, that host wild animals for sale whether it's a pet shop or whether it's like the profit market in bombay where even a, a innocent passer by who's just going through the market to access another area or happens to live in that that vicinity is just as prone to that zoonotic disease as somebody who's keeping that wild animal at home so it's now moved out of the realm of being just a foreign problem to a problem that like you said we all now are actually living with as a consequence of covid-19 um and i just want to quickly quote something from cdc that i read earlier today that i thought was very interesting uh and uh, this is the us cdc which is the us center for disease control and prevention and they say that science shows that more than 6 out of every 10 known infectious diseases can be spread from animals and 3 out of every 4 new or emerging infections comes from animals so i think that number itself is something that if we now start looking at as a, a outflow of illegal wildlife trade uh if that doesn't stop people from taking on pet uh, exotic animals as pets then i guess no law is going to ever compete with that wow 75% of disease the infectious disease from animals so uh, mridula say there is a law now suddenly a law is implemented what happens to the animals that are already there tomorrow because we have to also look at the mental trauma the physical trauma 
of these animals so we can always there can be an act that can come into being we can enact something but there could be hundreds of thousands of animals not just in india but all across the planet you don't know how many what happens to that can a species be sent back to its native land and a species that's there in captivity for so long or wild species which has been bred in captivity is it equipped to go back into the wild thanks anish um so legally it, anyway there is the provision of re-export of animals that have made their way to to a given country you know and it can be sent back to the country from where it came so a couple of years ago i remember there was a leopard cub that was seized at the chennai airport uh that came in from thailand and efforts were made to re-export it um so should there be a law and actually so basically the law exists it's just a question of bringing it within the ambit of domestic law and um you know seeing it be implemented um so in, in fact an effort was made to um to you know re-export the animal back to thailand um so there is of course the possibility of doing that uh, but whether you know animals that have been bred in captivity over generations are fit for release um back in the wild i think is a question that remains to be answered and and i think biologists like yourself um may be the right person to answer that question but um there is no question about that it being legal it's definitely possible to do um also interestingly you know for seizures under the wildlife act uh you find that magistrates often direct for the animal to be released in the wild so should you know should cites be implemented in india through the wildlife protection act i think it is not hard to implement it uh, and even make the proce- process more efficient and quick to to send the animal back uh thank you bridula uh, suman how technology can come to rescue of these animals who kind of at at the outset seemed like they are at mercy of human beings which is you know that that thought itself is a dampening for somebody like me who and all of us rather who think um, who will never want to sacrifice the freedom that we have in the nation that we live in so can we use is there do you know of any technology especially citizen science or any other thing that we can use to assist uh, in slowly but surely eradicating this dreadful uh, uh, trade that's happening across the planet i, th- I think there is something there in uh, citizen science is definitely a powerful tool uh, the the very simple messaging that united states went with several years ago uh, of if you see something say something type of message um, i think is a great great tool to sort of bring into india especially on the front of uh, wildlife trade be it in exotic or endemic uh, the number of instances we've been alerted about wildlife trade by someone who's going in a bus and they smell something fishy of somebody who's also traveling with them it's it's it, it's in it's the information's there the people there the capacity is there uh it's about leveraging the technology and the platform for it and again uh like a broken record i'm going to go back to the capacity of the law enforcement agencies unfortunately again these are the same people who are doing a multitude of things they just don't have the bandwidth to uh or or rather even the capacity to look at these platforms decipher the information that comes in because once you have a citizen science platform to say uh, report anybody who is having wildlife as pets or is in shop that is selling wildlife we often don't know what is endemic what is exotic um, and we i have people calling me almost every other day about some shop selling bajrigars which what people popularly call love birds uh and there's everyone thinks they're parrots because i mean that's that's generally what we look at we look at a bird with a with a beak in a certain shape and say parrots uh even though what we also do have in some shape in some stores are parakeets which are protected by the wildlife protection act mm-hmm. i think that because that the sense of awareness is lacking currently uh in the country overall the number of reports on any citizen science platform is going to be so many that it over a period of time it will just is just going to overburden the system and that sort of will uh, collapse on itself having said that i think that capacity even if it's built into existing law enforcement agencies it's still a great thing we we've, we've dealt with cases where 
uh, we've received information about uh, trade in endemic species of wildlife and have gone into shops which uh, which sell exotic wildlife as a front right on the right on the outside in display is all your budget figures cockatiels and whatnot and you go inside start chatting with them and you realize that in in reality uh, most of these pet shops or aquariums are a front for a lot of illegal wildlife trade in endemic protected species one instance comes to mind where we rescued these uh, malabar giant squirrels and star tortoises from a pet shop uh, and we went with with a with a range forest officer there to this pet shop to conduct the seizure and what was surprising to us was that the range forest officer was a regular visitor to the pet shop to buy fish food for his fish back home unfortunately he just did not have the capacity to look at a malabar giant squirrel and identify it as a species that is protected because the the even something as simple as the chameleon right you have chameleons the indian chameleons and the whale chameleons which are exotic which are imported and sold it's nearly impossible to tell them apart to uh, a forest officer unfortunately they don't go through that level of training of identification or you have wrongful seizures where they see iguanas and sees them as monitor lizards or as chameleons uh, that capacity even if it's built into uh into the forest department and the police for instance because what we do have is a government system an existing uh system wherein at every beat every village is under the jurisdiction of some forest officer some police officer there's somebody who walks through that place at least once in a week if not more often i think if their capacity is built in just keeping an eye out and how do you detect trade if you see a pet shop it's it's easy to just walk in take a look around as long as they know what they're looking for and that's the that that i think is the true true challenge uh and technology can be a great help there uh, for instance if there can be uh if there can be platforms where where a forest officer who doesn't know to identify species clicks a picture and everybody has smartphones now technology could lend itself in helping identify uh, a narrower list of species that it could be and what their level of protection are be it under wildlife protection act or under cites what appendix they fall under that's i think a very very realistic technology that can be leveraged uh, i mean facial recognition is moving really at, at at a rapid pace now uh, and i don't see why those can't be translated to animals and be given to the right hands uh, that i think is definitely definitely the way forward uh, building capacity of ground level staff is a huge huge uh, Uh, it, it's going to make this so much more easier on the implementation side of it right i think uh, many many valid points there uh, suma then because see detection of smuggled animals across ports or on airports or just on road when it you know at the border we have failed we have failed our wildlife and the global wildlife and others co species that coexist with us but at least i think there is huge amount of hope uh, and optimistic about the next generation because i see young people a lot of young people who are in touch with me many of those are in school 7th standard 6th standard 8th standard and i get invited to be a jury on a debate that's going on and the kind of stuff that come up thanks to the internet i'm not saying they are all experienced but they have access to this powerful medium they are already more sensitive towards um, mental trauma when i was growing up in india you couldn't talk about mental trauma i mean you if you are injured you are injured but if you are mentally unstable or you are not feeling okay uh, or you are depressed that was a taboo okay but now the generation has really evolved for the better and i think uh, because of that their sensitivities they are able to share and there are so many people who are technologically savvy and who have the right as uh, heart in the right place i think if we can harness the good positive energy from this generation that's growing today i think we'll give them uh something to look forward to something to contribute to and that's why i said citizen science because once people start contributing and they start seeing the change and they start owning it i think that's the best way to spread it because it, there is you can't learn this in a classroom it's you are born with a passion for something and there are millions of people across the planet who are born with the passion for nature i think we who are practicing conservationists it is our shortcoming that we are not able to you know provide ways to these people and young people especially to contribute so 
i think uh, people who are listening to us if they can get some ideas out of this and if if us who are now talking and we can also rope in other people if we can you know decide to launch a platform for instance think about the qr code who had ever thought that you could know what you are going to eat or what are the negative implications of the food that you are eating if you are allergic to something all that is available everything payments everything is possible why when so many species look so different from each other even if they are related cannot have something like a qr code where you just hold that phone in front of a bajriga it tells you that it's a bajriga and not a parakeet or not a macaw or a parrot right or a lorry i think already it exists there are morphing softwares that people are using but lot of it is being used for the wrong reasons so all those guys who are listening if they can uh, utilize that and if we have that kind of a tool in our hands uh, then lot of people will start calling out and when there is a pressure it's it's similar to you know um, a mask if you don't wear a mask there was a time when people would come to you and say hey uh, dude this is not just for your safety but please put on a mask you will make others safe around you because it was so prevalent and so many people were suffering from it could come and talk to you otherwise you know just 2 years ago if a stranger comes and talks to you say mind your own business so i think um, there is a message out there and we must definitely utilize technology i'm not saying that it will solve everything because like mridula said we need to change modify our law we need to also like samyukta in the initial stages talk about, talked about why people keep pets because they feel lonely so we need to find solutions to that loneliness right uh, and animals are not toys or tools so that you can fight your loneliness if you are a human being you can go and travel to nature enjoy species in the wild the pleasure of seeing a wild animal do what that animal has done for millions of years with no strings attached is unparalleled and so rather than having a two way a one way relationship where what is the animal going to do to you i feel good looking at the fish in the aquarium i feel good when my dog comes and jumps on me whenever i return back on home we need to start thinking in the opposite way what am i doing for the animal and am i going to provide all that that animal needs food mate wild space and all those other species that that animal is connected with these are the bigger questions that we must ask i think today's conversation is extremely useful i have also learned so many things from you people before we end today's session i would want to come back to all three of you because i believe that one of the biggest strengths of india is its social capital and nearly 65% of all indians are younger than 35 years of age i feel that we should give a message to the audience and see how uh, we can garner their support so i would uh, in any order that you feel right but you may also want to give a message to the government you may also want to give a message to the forest department it's your time you you may give one or you may give two messages think about it and uh, whoever is ready you can unmute yourself and start talking over to you perfect uh the what i do want to say is that we've spoken about a wide variety of topics today everything from disease transmission to uh mental health physical health we've spoken about a wide variety of things and uh what i think none of us wanted to do is for anyone who is listening uh, to make it sound like dealing with wildlife trade in general is overwhelming that's not what what the intention of this is in that sense i think everybody all of us who are, everyone who is listening everyone who is in india outside india wherever we are there are simple things that we can do uh, to be a part of the change towards the better right the first thing is make yourselves as aware as possible of everything happening around you uh, when we think of wildlife and wildlife trade we tend to think of it as something that's happening somewhere really far from us uh, and something that's beyond our powers to sort of control uh, and the assumption is it's wildlife trade there are bigger things to worry about what we don't uh, realize is that wildlife trade is connected to everything from arms trafficking to human trafficking to drug trade it's all connected so start with making yourself aware uh, there's enough resources around uh, and there's enough talks like this now thanks to uh, thanks to zoom that you can make yourself aware once you do understand the laws around you for uh, for me growing up uh, the law seemed like something that was out of our reach and too complicated to understand but you read the wildlife protection act for instance it's very simple language very easy to understand read your laws know your officers and start holding them accountable when all of us start holding them accountable for what they are supposed to do under the law 
things will change. Right now, it's a very small number of us in India or outside India talking about this and making some bit of noise about this. It needs, like Anish said, a larger movement of people holding the officers, holding the elected representatives accountable. So I would say start with making yourself aware of issues happening around you, the laws related to them, and those who are, uh, who are custodians of those laws. It's as simple as that. It may seem overwhelming, but a simple, simple, small step will go a great way in bringing about a monumental change. Thanks. You want to go, Mridula, next? Sure, thank you. Well, I think uh, individuals were a little more aware um, of the kind of havoc the trade in wildlife wrecks, not just on an individual and animal, but on ecosystems across the world. Um, I think this would be far, far less of a problem if we were just a little more aware. Uh, and also, I think each of us, no matter what our skill sets, have something to contribute. So whether you're an illustrator or a lawyer or a biologist or, or an engineer, uh, you have something to offer. Um, so so I, think, I think involving yourself more deeply is a great way to contribute to combating not just the trade, but even larger you know, and broader environmental issues. So, so you're, you're never inadequate or incompetent and you always have something to offer. Um, most importantly, I think uh, it's so important to exercise our democratic rights and voice what we want to see change in the law. Um, so don't underestimate the power of talking about it, demanding accountability, uh, and ensuring that the law changes uh, in, in such a way as to ensure conservation uh, that has its best shot. Um, so I think I'm just going to grab bits and pieces from what everybody said, because I think everyone's already covered amazing ground. Uh, but I just want to leave every or our audience with this thought that we are all benefactors of a healthy functioning wild ecosystem, whether it's in our country or whether it's in another nation that's thousands of miles away. So we all have a role to play in ensuring that we act against and use, use our voices and our vote power against illegal wildlife trade, especially if we don't want our future generations to only know pangolins as a stuffed animal or any other wild animal as simply a stuffed animal or a stuffed toy that you can play with. Uh, I think that's my message for the audience. Uh, and for the government of India, I think I really want to pat them on the back and say that you've already won half the battle by including uh, the need to implement CITES under the Wildlife Protection Act as part of the larger national wildlife plan that has been designed for 2017 to 2031. We're already half the way there. So now we just need to take the few more steps forward to not just create the law that specifically targets exotic species trade within the country, but also creates mechanisms and empowers a variety of officers that can work together to create a really st strong system to act against uh, incidences of illegal wildlife trade. So that's my messaging for everybody. Anybody wants to add anything else? Um, yeah, I, I think for the government, um, it's incredible to see the, the way you manage uh, to, to pay attention to an issue like wildlife trafficking in a country of 1.3 billion people, where there's burning issues, um, you know, every day, all the time. And so I think that's incredible. Uh, but we already have the, the framework that is needed. Uh, all we need is really at this juncture a final push to make sure that we don't um, endanger our own lives by by having more trade in exotic animals. So, uh, and I think also organizations like WCT and individuals like uh, the, you know, the four of us here uh, right now are available uh, to support in any way, any way possible. Yeah, thanks. Thank you all of you. Hopefully next time when we get together, we can speak far more positively about uh, the issues of animals and then hopefully we'll only have to talk about issues of wild animals in the wild and there are a million such issues. Let's not add to that. Um, I, I really am grateful to 
both uh, Mridula and Suman to accept our invitation and our request to come and talk to us and also enlighten the audience about this very, very, very important issue. Samyukta, of course, is a Pied Piper in, within WCT and also plays a big role in spreading awareness about these issues within our organization. We work on large landscapes, we work on wildlife in India, but that doesn't mean that there is enough knowledge within the organization about illegal trade in wildlife, uh, especially pet trade, forensics and all that. So thank you, all three of you. I just hope uh, that uh, this particular discussion is the starting point of a, a campaign you know, that we can launch jointly. And let us not own this campaign as the campaign by human society or by Mridula or by WCT. Let us kind of create something which is not, has no boundary, which has basically anybody who wants to join in should be part of it. Definitely, we must put some rules down that it is not an activist campaign. It is a campaign where we are talking to grown-ups and we are giving grown-ups the opportunity to behave like responsible uh, denizens of this planet. Let's not uh, look down upon the capacity of a, a thief or a murderer to change, right? In the same way, there are people who are probably on the wrong side of the law. There are people who unknowingly are damaging things. Let's be respectful of the background that they come from. There are reasons why things are the way they are. But I think if we can keep a campaign which doesn't become our own property, uh, I think we will be able to garner far more support and good positive energy uh, from both the young and the old to jointly try and undo the kind of damage that uh, our generation and the generation before us has done to the species uh, that make uh, our blue planet so rich. So I thank everybody once again, and I would hand over the stage to Rizwan to sum up today's discussion. Thank you so much. Wow, what an enlightening session, Anish. And I have a feeling that um, this discussion that we had today is going to inspire change. And as you mentioned, a campaign that will you know, lead to solutions and then finally you'll see us uh, trying to find an end to this problem. Thank you, Anish, Nidula, Sumant, and Samyukta for that very informative conversation. Thank you all for watching. Uh, we hope this session was useful and insightful for you. If there are any takeaways for you, we hope and we are sure there were from this discussion, please share them with your friends on your social media handles with the hashtag trapped in trade. And you could tag us uh, at WCT India. Thank you once again and happy wildlife week.